they discovered upon their arrival was almost unspeakable. We are all evil in some form or another. I am not guilty. <laughs> the dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. Something if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. Hello and welcome to the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. I'm Vicky. And I'm Eileen. I'm back again. She's back. She's still here. I can't get her to leave. She'll never leave. <laughs> I'm I, just kidding. I, I'm so controlled because I could make a lot of comments and tell stories and whatnot. And I'm thinking, how long did it take you to leave my house? Yeah, very. This is true. This is true. We are back again with another great episode. If this is your first time listening, a special hello to you. I'm very excited. If you haven't guessed, January is like the month of scammers. <laughs> We're True doing that. True all that. scammers all the time. <laughs> yes, they start in December and just keep rolling right through the holidays. Yes. Um, so we will get to that in just a moment. But first, let's head over to the newsroom. This week, our news comes to us from Thailand. Ooh, across the world. Across the world. Well, at least in the airport. Um, <laughs> so a 22-year-old Taiwanese man was arrested at a Thailand airport. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that name. Um, on December 5th, because customs caught him trying to smuggle two otters and a prairie dog. Ooh, Merry Christmas. Into the country. Yeah. Two otters and a prairie dog into Thailand. Yes. So they don't have otters and prairie dogs? In oh, Thailand? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not into Thailand. Out of Thailand um, on a flight that was going to Taipei. Is that in Thailand? No. Okay. I don't. So going from Thailand to Taipei. Gotcha. So basically what he did is he had pantyhose and he put uh, the animals into these pantyhose and then tied them around his waist with packing tape. I'm stunned. Yeah. And so they said that his odd behavior and visible bulges in his pants... (laughs) Caught the attention of officers. Did you say visible bulges in his pants? Yes. Okay. I thought that's what you said. Yeah, but I don't think they're bulges in the places they're supposed to be bulges. Right. <laughs> um, and he was walking through an x-ray machine and they were like, nah. <laughs> um, I'm just picturing that x-ray with these extra little skeletons around him. Yeah. Oh, the poor little thing. So obviously he's looking he's getting charges related to trafficking and prohibited goods, removing protected wildlife from their natural habit and attempting to export wildlife without a proper license. This is one of the things that I find really interesting is so these are not otters. I mean otters have not like they're not they don't really have claws. You know, they're they're they have webbed Okay. Feet, I, I'm pretty sure. Maybe not all of their feet, but some of them are. I mean, they're not like I scratchers, don't know really. I anatomy that well. But, you but they have them. a picture of this prairie dog, and it's got these giant, like, talon nails. And I'm like, how is that comfortable? This is the, the picture of the bulges in the pants, as you can see. So they're like three separate things of pantyhose that he like tied and have essentially hanging from a waistband down. So it would be like three separate bulges. The first thing I thought was that he pants. was wearing the pantyhose. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but, no, okay. no, 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 no. They're like in the pantyhose and, and then tied around. It must him. be young animals because otters and um these are rather large animals in yeah. adulthood. Yeah. They were they were pretty small. So that happened. <laughs> it shouldn't. Uh, we're going to move on to Netflix and Kill, where this week we are talking about Who Killed Jill Dando, which is on Netflix. And I was not familiar with Jill Dando. I was not either. Until this. Um, so she was a British uh, TV personality and... Um, she did a lot of like news anchoring and reporting right. for the BBC. 
pretty sure it was for the BBC. I think so. Um, and she was kind of this like TV darling. Yes. Uh, they compared. They actually compared her a lot to Princess Diana. And also, she had kind of that look too. Yes. And they talked a little bit about the haircut and who had it first. Did yeah, she did or Princess Diana. Yeah, and she. They all said she did. That's what I remember too. Um, but it is, yeah, it's that sort of like short blonde yes. look. Yes. And then in 1999, out of nowhere, Jill Dando was shot in the head on the front steps of her house. Mm -hmm. There was little daylight in broad daylight in the middle of the day. There was little to no evidence left behind. Um, Not really any witnesses. There were some that were a little like... You know, not any solid witnesses or no No. descriptions of this person, really. So police began investigating. Obviously, there's this huge public outcry for swift investigation to find out who did this. There's also these connections that they're looking into that have to do with, like, the was it like the Serbian war? I think that was it. Yeah, and her reporting on that, yes. and some retaliation potentially, but they were kind of quick to dismiss that, um, and eventually land on this guy uh, who is eventually arrested, convicted, and then later released as wrongfully convicted. Right. That whole thing is kind of interesting because he definitely, I mean, they're talking about these pictures of him wearing a mask and holding a gun, but he says it's not him. He does admit to having these weapons in the house, but like there's these pictures that he was like taking of women that were just pictures he was taking of women. And it's, I mean, that whole thing is like kind of strange. Yes. It sounded like he was like a little lower on the IQ scale. Scale, and yeah. he didn't really seem to hold a job and just kind of wandered the streets mm-hmm. talking to women. Yeah, yeah. But I do feel like he probably did not do it and they were like looking for somebody to sort of pin this on. Well, I liked that it was either a, they, they seem to be leaning toward either it's a professional hit. Yeah. By some intelligent, talented person who could do this without being seen. Mm -hmm. And this, or this low income or low income, low IQ gentleman. Yeah. Who, you know, just kind of did it. Yeah. Spur the moment without any planning or kind of extremes in what they thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So this murder is still unsolved, technically, to this day. Uh, and so nobody still knows who did it. It's a really interesting case just because of the facts, like the fact that it happened yes. in broad daylight yes. in front of her house in an yes. area that is pretty highly trafficked. Right. And they had so much um, CCTV. Yes. The closed caption television that they tracked her movements through for the longest period going into stores and this, that and the other. And then. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very interesting. Did you notice, and I only watched it once and I meant to go back, that how they presented it, they would, um, the police would say, well, maybe it's for this reason, her, somebody she worked with or her agent or Mm -hmm. whoever, and then they would interview the agent and they mentioned something about her boyfriend, but I never saw him really talk about what he, where he was, what he did, why it wasn't him. Yeah. Um, her boyfriend at the time, right? Right. Yeah. So they, I mean, they talk about, oh, it was her fiance. That's um, right. Um, and they talk about some of these extra, like, relationships that she had, not outside of her relationship, but she, before she was engaged, right. she had right. some, like, fling, brief flings and, like, all of the stuff that they ended up finding out about in her diaries, I think. And they sort of looked into some of those people. Um, but there weren't really any of those leads that panned out mm-hmm. for, for the, poor, the young man who was uh, finally mm-hmm. arrested. It just seemed like, okay, let's, let's arrest somebody. And he's a good choice. Yeah. 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 It was George something. 
George, Barry George. Barry George is the name of the guy. And again, it's like, there is part of me that feels like taking it. I mean, I guess the stuff that he had in his apartment, because they talk about um, they found over 2000 images of women in his apartment taken without permission. Um, They found magazines that had Jill Dando on the cover, some things that had Princess Diana, like in them, a bunch of pictures of Princess Diana. And I feel like it does seem very suspicious, but like. If they hadn't been looking into a murder, would you find all of that as suspicious? Can I just say his apartment could have used a good cleaning and it was just stacked with Yeah. Tons. It was like hoarded out. It was it was hoarded. So yeah. it's not surprising if maybe you have a thousand magazines that one of them might have a picture of Princess Di on the cover. Yeah, yeah. So Barry George, yeah, he was in in prison for eight years total. Mm -hmm. He wasn't released until 2008. And then he was attempting to get compensation for his wrongful conviction, but it was denied by the high court in 2013, which is kind of interesting. So basically they said uh, they denied it on the basis that until a new fact arises that proves beyond reasonable doubt that George did not commit the crime, there would be no payment. So, like, until basically they're saying he's innocent, but, like, until somebody else comes forward or there's another fact, like, yeah, maybe he still could have done it. Like, You want to know that he really, really. That he's actually innocent, innocent. yeah. So, I don't know. It's it's a really interesting case. It's called Who Killed Jill Dando on Netflix. Definitely check it out. This is that part of the show where we say content may not be appropriate for all listeners. Um, There's going to be some talk of violence. You said... Body brokering. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have a sensitivity to, like, loved ones, parts being donated. And I know people who have done that. Mm-hmm. And I, I definitely know that is something that's necessary to do and wonderful. But this might not be the story you Might not be the one listen. for you. Yes. yes. So as I said at the top of the episode, in the month of January, it is all scammers all the time. And we are back again this week to talk about some more scammy scam scammers. So I am going to start off this week. And I was not, I don't know what I was looking for when I was trying to decide what to cover, but I can tell you it was not this. And I was pleasantly surprised because this is like the wildest story I've never heard. (laughs) Truthfully. I like how you said that. Yes. Um, and I'm kind of bummed because this is very much up Janelle's alley. Okay. <laughs> this story because it's about a wrestler. Oh, of yes. course. So we are going to be talking about Jerry Bibb Balasak. Have you ever heard of not him before? Heard of him. And I know we're not a wrestling family. So like. We, no. It, no. Yeah. No connection whatsoever. So Balasak was originally from Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, He moved with his parents as a toddler to Huntsville, Alabama. His father was a school teacher and his mother, Marjorie, was a nurse. Now, when he was just 13, Balasak's father died of a heart attack, which left his mom to raise him alone. And he was an only child. Okay. While attending Huntsville High School, Balasak was an all-star wrestler, eventually getting the attention of a promoter named Buddy Fuller, who ran events for the South Southeastern Championship Wrestling in the area. After graduating high school in 1973, Balasak went to Florida to train before returning to Huntsville in 1974 to take a crack at a professional wrestling career. Now, there was some interesting politics at play at the time that Balasak entered wrestling, and I did not know this was like a whole thing back then. Okay. Um, so this would have been in, what did I say, 74. So first, at this time, he found out that his college eligibility might be at stake if he decided to pursue a career in pro wrestling. You couldn't be a professional and then... Get college. Yeah. So so during okay. this time, like while he was in Florida, Balasaka was watched by the University of Tampa as a possible recruit, but being paid as a pro wrestler would bar Balasak from NCAA wrestling. Okay. At this point in time, this was before pro wrestling was seen as entertainment and instead it was competition. Right. Which is not the case now. That didn't really change until um, McMahon came into play and started advertising it 
as entertainment and made an argument to the government that it was entertainment and therefore didn't need to be regulated, (laughs) um, which is a whole other thing. But at the time, it was considered a competitive sport still. So he couldn't like double dip, essentially. So Buddy Fuller, uh, the promoter, managed to convince Balasak to wrestle under the character Mr. X, uh, which is a pretty common character people have used. uh, But it allowed him to wear a mask and hopefully protect his identity for future ventures. Sneaky. That's what I was thinking. So he wrestles for a year as Mr. X, and then Balasak leaves wrestling to attend the University of Tampa, and he was attempting to earn a scholarship as a walk-on wrestler. So he didn't have a scholarship when he won. He did not. He was working as Mr. X. He was saving up all of this money that he was making wrestling to attend college, which I kind of admire. Yeah, that's a noble activity. For sure. But... But unfortunately, the coaches had learned about his pro wrestling career as Mr. X and told him, like, we know you're this guy. Unfortunately, that means you can't join our team. And so they wouldn't let him wrestle. So once you've done it, that's, that's it. it. And you're out forever. Yes. Yeah. Um, the coaches never revealed how they learned of his career, but there is some speculation that Fuller, the promoter, tipped the coaches off so that Balasak would consider, can continue pro wrestling. That's mean. It is. <laughs> but, like, also kind of standard for the 70s. You know what I mean? Like, Yes, but that's not nice. No. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So Balasak continued wrestling as Mr. X from 1975 to 1977 when he was involved in a motorcycle accident and had to have a pin placed in his hip, putting his career at, career at risk. Okay. You know, there. you know a little yeah. about that. I've, yeah, I have two pins. <laughs> yes. So while he was recovering from his injury and taking time off from wrestling, Balasak decided to enter some more financial pursuits. And by financial pursuits, I mean check forgery. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> There's many different kinds of yeah, right. <laughs> financial pursuits. And during, that's one. So during this time, Balasak had also begun dating a Huntsville woman named Deborah Kindred, who was sort of in the middle of this divorce and that she was like working through this divorce when the two of them started dating. The FBI caught wind of Balasak's check scams and began an investigation in 1977 before rendering a 13-count indictment for writing bad checks over international lines. Oh, okay. And he was looking at 10 years in prison for each count because the prosecution was alleging that he was using fraudulent checks to pay for motorcycle parts in the Caribbean while he was on an international wrestling tour. Okay, so that's where the international part comes in. Yes. Fearing prison time, Balasak and Kindred, who had just, she had just finalized her divorce okay. with her now ex-husband, um, and she had a son from this previous marriage. So Balasak, Kindred, and Kindred's son decided to flee Huntsville to avoid the law. Before leaving, however, the couple broke into the home of one of Kindred's cousins, Ricky Allen Weta, to steal his birth certificate, driver's license, and social security card. Gotcha. A little ID theft. Hmm. Balasak used this information to assume Weta's identity and married Kindred under Weta's name. So from this point on... If I, I'm going to probably use them interchangeably because there's some things that refer to him as Balasak and some things that refer to him as Weta. But if you hear Weta, just know it's Balasak. Okay. <laughs> They're the same person. Because the cousin never comes into the story. Nope. Okay. He never comes in. By the time the check forgery trial was set to begin in 1978, Balasak and Kindred were already living under the new identities in Puerto Rico. Okay. They Yeah. They go down to Miami and then leave to Puerto right Rico. Now. Just trying to keep up here. I know. This is, it gets a little yes. twisty turny. While there, Balasak, under the name Weta, got picked up by another wrestling promoter and began wrestling around Puerto Rico. Okay. In the meantime, the FBI issued a warrant for Balasak's arrest after he dodged his trial. Uh, they started searching for him. They managed to figure out that he had gone from Alabama to Florida and knew that he had ventured into the Caribbean at some point, but 
lost track of him after that and they weren't able to really like cultivate any leads gotcha later in 1978 balasak and kindred left puerto rico for the bahamas and um he was going there to wrestle in some other events in the bahamas but after a while he was informed that once his visa that well one his visa was getting ready to expire and then he was informed that the government was not going to renew his visa once it expired so they would have to leave the country so they opted to travel back to the states and s- sort of settled in Seattle, Washington. Now the government at this point doesn't know he's changed no, names. No, um, and I'm, it's unclear why the visa wouldn't have been renewed. But like, that's also not that uncommon right. as a foreigner, right? So they go back to Seattle, Washington. There, Balasak got employment at Boeing, where he impressed interviewers with his aerospace knowledge. I wonder where he got that. Well, he told them that he attended the University of Cambridge in England, ah. which was, of course, a lie. <laughs> that was, I don't know where he got the aerospace knowledge. I wonder if it's harder to check information, and you were talking in the 70s. Yes. Harder to check information internationally versus in the u.s like it could be it could be but it is just trusting more i mean it's still it might take a little longer just because you're probably searching physical records right um but i mean you still can verify it Mm -hmm. so he tells them he attended the university of cambridge he did not boeing eventually discovers this lie um, within like the first year of his employment at some i don't even know that he made it a whole year I think that would be tough to impersonate a, what was it, aerospace engineer? Um, It didn't specify what his job was, just that he was working for Boeing. Okay. But it sounded like it was something like kind of high up because like they were very impressed with him. Where you would need a certain knowledge. Right, right. And skill set. Yeah. So they fired him. Let a, he left, um, and he Balasak, who was, of course, still living under the name Weta, he was fired from the company in 1979. So we're going to step back just a little bit, back to 1978. So there's a really, really important thing that happens at the end of 1978 in the world at large. So longtime listeners know that this is the case that ultimately got me interested in cults. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, there's so many. This is like the one. Do you know? Cults. Jim Jones? It is. It is. Yay. One yeah. Point. So I am talking about the Jonestown Massacre and Jim Jones. So for those who are unfamiliar, on November 8, 18th, 1978, 918 people were murdered in Guyana by Jim Jones' orders, most of them by consuming cyanide. A few others were shot. It's still the largest mass suicide in history and often the first thing that people think about when you talk about cults. They're like, oh, like drinking the Kool-Aid. Right. Which it wasn't Kool-Aid. It was Flavor-Aid. I'm just going to put it By out the there. Way, I'm really glad I got that one right. I'm thinking, yeah. okay, I know my daughter. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so this is all happening at the end of 1978. Okay. So following all of that um, and the tragic events of Jonestown – Life magazine runs an article, um, including images, in their January 1979 issue. And most people have probably seen these. There are a lot of aerial images of all of the um, bodies yes, left. I remember those. Yes. One of the people who read this issue was Balasak's mother, Marjorie. Okay. At this point, she was left to deal with Balasak skipping town, so, honestly, sudden, suddenly disappearing. Like, she didn't know where he went, what he was doing, what was going on. She was assisting the police and the FBI in the search, like, when he skipped town, that she she had absolutely no knowledge of any of that. Children should never do that to their parents. Sorry. Well, You're you... going to be real depressed by this oh, one, then. <laughs> yes. Well, you've never done it. Or well, not either, yet. Neither. I don't expect <laughs> that you will. So... She saw Marjorie sees this issue of life and she claimed to recognize Balasak and Kindred's bodies along with that of Kindred's five year old stepson or five year old son amongst the dead bodies in one of the aerial photos. That would be a horrible feeling. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, according to Mental Floss, quote, Marjorie contacted the U.S. State Department's Jonestown Task Force and told them she wanted to claim the body of her son. But the State Department informed her that none of the bodies examined were anywhere close to being that of Jerry Balasak, nor were any those of his wife and stepson. Dental x-rays had been taken of all the deceased, and there were zero matches with Jerry's dental records. And did she believe that? No. Marjorie was absolutely convinced that it was her son. Uh, even sending, she sent the pelvic x-rays because he, of course, had the pins oh, the, right, in the hip. Right. Um, she sent them to the officials for comparison, but they pretty much denied even looking at them because they're like, we literally have no evidence that he was amongst any of these people. I don't remember the aerial pictures being that close up yeah. that you could really... There were some aerial and there were some that were taken closer to the ground where you can sort of, maybe not aerial, but you can sort of see like the multitudes of, of bodies that were a little closer up. Okay. Marjorie was so convinced that it was Balasak in the photos that she began going to the press to plead her case. In 1979, in a 1979 article in Star News, she said, quote, There is no doubt in my mind about the figure being the body of my son. He is lying with his dark brownish auburn curly head pointing toward the bottom of the picture and page, end quote. But authorities just continued to insist it was not Balasak. Marjorie, unfortunately, would go to her grave believing that her son had died in the Jonestown Massacre. Even having a gravestone made for Balasak and placed above an empty grave in the family plot that reads, Murdered in Guyana, November 13th, 1978. Buried in Oakland, California, May 1979. Damn the State Department. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And the Oakland part is important because they had, um, it was something like... 20 to 25 unidentified bodies okay. that they transported to Oakland and sort of buried in a mass plot. Okay. So that's why he, she said buried in Oakland because they, she wanted to look at those bodies and they were like, nah. And she just went, she died. She was convinced. Yeah. She was convinced. And there are people like that. Yeah. Just, yep. Marjorie died in 1983, never knowing the truth. Just a year later, the FBI abandoned the search for Balasak, and due to lack of evidence, the Alabama State Attorney General's office dropped the check forgery charges, assuming he was dead. Okay. I think unrelated to Jonestown. They were just like, we don't have any evidence that he's still right. alive. Once those charges are dropped, can charges, they can be reinstated. If they you... can be reinstated if they're within the statute of limitations. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is, I think that's part of it too, is they were getting towards the end of the statute of limitations. Anyway. Right. So meanwhile, all of that's happening. Meanwhile, Balasak is continuing to live as Ricky Allen Weta in the Pacific Northwest, completely okay. unaware that these charges uh, related to the bad checks have been dropped. He does not know this. Right. In the early 80s, Balasak was earning some money from uh, commercial real estate development. So he had gotten into commercial real estate development. Many skills. Yes. Making himself sort of a small fortune. Uh, Balasak, I mean, he, he pretty much laid low until he purchased the Columbian Hotel in Wenatchee, Washington. According to a later court case, Weta had purchased the property for $135,000 and took out over $4 million in insurance on the property. That sounds a little... Sketchy? Unusual. Sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> sounds weird, right? I would be surprised that an insurance company wouldn't have come out to see the property or request information and say, that's a lot of insurance for this. Well, this would have been... In the mid, I believe it was in the mid 80s. So, yes, but I still feel anytime I talk about like the 70s or 80s, I just feel like shit was the Wild West on every level. No matter what you were doing, it was like latchkey kids taking out life insurance policies on whoever you want and taking massive policies out on houses and burning them down. And like, you know, like. It's a little what, crazy. What, I'm trying to think. What year was in the 80s? It would have been like mid 80s. Mid 80s. When he bought that. So I was just slightly younger than you are now. Yes. In the mid 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> is that what you're trying to put into context? I to, I, yes, that's what I was trying to put into context. Uh, I don't remember it being the Wild West. It was just <laughs> It was normal. just the 80s. <laughs> it was normal. <laughs> so he buys this hotel property, takes out of an over $4 million insurance, prop, uh, insurance policy on the property. Just a month later... Quote, the hotel burned to the ground in a fire of suspicious origin. Oh, I hate when that happens. End quote. <laughs> Don't you hate it? Oh, my gosh. What an inconvenience. So police were obviously very quick to assume that an arson had happened and indicted Balasag for the crime, saying he had burned it down for the insurance money. I understand where they're coming from. I hope they have some proof. Or I should say they indicted Weta. Ah, Yes. Of the crime. Yes, okay. Yeah, they indicted Weta of the crime. Uh, this was largely based on the testimony of a man named Daniel Binford, who alleged that uh, Weta had offered him $10,000 to burn down the hotel. Binford wasn't... That is, like, from tool time. That Binford hardware... Or, oh, I'm sorry, I just went off on it. I don't know. <laughs> Binford just struck a... a Nerd yeah. with me. So he says he got offered this money. Um, they arrest Weta slash Balasak. He gets taken into custody and fingerprinted, but the fingerprints do not come up as Jerry Balasak in their system. Their systems were probably not as good back then. It was the 80s. <laughs> it was the 80s. Um, Very normal time. So he gets fingerprinted and then he is, from what I can tell, released awaiting trial. Okay. However, everything sort of changes when a man named Emmett Thompson II comes stumbling bloody out of the woods at Tiger Mountain. Okay. This is a turn you did not see coming, Uh, probably. (laughs) No. Thompson is rushed to the hospital where he tells authorities, I have a story for you. According to later testimony, Thompson revealed that he was a business associate of Weta and that he had actually been the one to start the fire at the hotel. Why was he telling authorities this now? Because Weta had just attempted to kill him (laughs) at Tiger Mountain. So he's kind of between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. So this is from a later uh, Supreme Court decision. Ooh. Supreme Court. Yeah, a lot of there's. Oh my gosh, it's a whole this whole thing. So uh, from the decision, quote: Thompson and Weta went target shooting at Tiger Mountain outside of Issaquah, armed with Weta's custom made rifle. Thompson testified that on the way back to the car, he suddenly heard three pops, realized he had been shot in the head, and fell to the ground. He covered his head and a final bullet entered his arm. Realizing that he was still alive and that Weta meant to kill him, Thompson got up and stumbled out of the woods where he was helped by a couple parked on the side of the road. Thompson survived and Weta was arrested at the scene. End quote. Weird. Okay. Very weird, right? So... Thompson tells all of this to authorities while he's at the hospital. He agrees to testify at trial in exchange for prosecutorial immunity. Okay. For the arson. So he for the arson, yeah. So he won't he will not be prosecuted for the arson if he if he testifies in this now attempted murder trial. Or and and the arson trial against Weta. Quick question, slash you and your legal background. If okay. someone does that, okay. um, do, does the jury know that they're not being prosecuted for giving evidence? Um, there me? are rules around that. Um, I do believe that the if, – if I might be mistaken, but I am like 90% sure they have to tell the jury that um, because like – are you receiving immunity for your testimony today? Because they need to know the context and what the testimony is right. coming from. Okay. I think, I think I'm like, like I said, like 90% sure. Okay. So Thompson agrees to testify. Weta is getting booked into King County, Washington for attempted murder. And while this is happening, it was at this point that Authorities discover that Ricky Allen Weta is actually Jerry Bibb Balasak, according to his fingerprints. So f- so the fingerprint thing 
worked eventually. In King County. And it could just be a variation in counties. It could just be, I where, don't know. Where they sent the fingerprints. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How they took, if maybe if they took fingerprints that weren't like up to snuff and they no, just didn't like possibly. recognize. I'm not sure. So while he's getting this trial for attempted murder, all of a sudden they're like, we just found this guy that we thought was dead and had evaded capture for, at this point, years. He had left in, um, what did I say? It was, it was like, like 1974, 76. Um, 1977. Okay. Was pretty much when they left. And he was discovered in like the mid 80s. So they, I mean, this has been like years. Right. Makes national news that actually Jerry Balasak is alive. Um, so everybody knows now. And Balasak went to trial in, so his trial starts in 89. Is, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of the hotel stuff is happening. He kind of lays low. And then towards the end of the 80s, is when the arson happens and then the attempted murder. And so his trial starts in 89. Yeah. So this is like years. Right. So Balsak went to trial in 1989 where he claimed self-defense. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready for this one? Uh, okay. Again, from the same Supreme Court decision, quote, Weta stated that while they were target shooting, Thompson informed him for the first time that he had set the fire. Weta was shocked that Thompson had done this and informed Thompson that he would have to tell his lawyer about this. Weta testified that when they were almost back to the car, Thompson turned around with a dagger in his hand, told Weta he was not going to go to prison and started slashing at Weta. Weta, who at the time weighed over 300 pounds, backed away from Thompson, at which point Thompson put him in a headlock and tried to slash his throat. Weta claimed that while he was being attacked by Thompson, he realized he had a pistol in his jacket pocket. He pulled it out and after firing a warning shot, shot Thompson four times, end quote. Okay. I'm, why would Thompson have a reason to burn down the building? It's a good question. Because it's like, oh, by the way, I just burned down your building. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to tell the police. Okay. You... Just don't. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Um, defense attorneys even allowed Balasag to do a reenactment with an associate playing Thompson in front of the jury. So he was allowed to reenact what he he was saying He's, was happening. Gotcha. Okay. The headlock and the whole. Okay. Yes. Um, there were also <laughs> some really interesting exchanges in regards to Balasag's true identity. Uh, many, many of these questions he just refused to answer at trial, including this exchange from a trial transcript. Deputy Prosecutor Michael Hogan, you've talked about your health history, Mr. Weta. You've testified that you that your weight as you went through school. Where did you go to school, Mr. Weta? Defense attorney Ann Englehard. Objection. This isn't relevant. The court, you may answer. Hogan, where did you go to grade school, Mr. Weta? Weta, I refuse to answer your question. Hoga, where did you go to high school when you told us those weights? Weta, I believe I got a GED in the state of Washington in 1979. Hogan, but when, when you were a teenager, did you attend high school? Weta, I refuse to answer that question also. Hogan, and you used to be a professional wrestler, didn't you, Mr. Weta? Weta, and I also refuse to answer that question. <laughs> So he's trying to like, he had, he's talked about things in the trial that were like, oh yeah, like I had this really hard childhood. I was picked on. I gained this weight. I did this wrestling. And then they're like, so where did you do all this stuff? Where were you at when? And he's like, I'm not going to let you know. Yeah. 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 Cause I'm not telling. He realizes like, they know that I am not. Well, wow. so at this point. Yeah. He's, okay. At this point, he realizes because they've never said anything about him. He's never said anything about him being a wrestler. Right. And so the fact that they're just like, so you were a wrestler, right? And he was like, mm, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> On the grounds I may incriminate right, myself. Right. Now, during uh, deliberations, the jury attempted their own reenactment of events. Um, so they took his story, what is, or Balasak's story, 
And they uh, tried to reenact it in every way possible to figure out um, – because a lot of it had to do with, like, where the bullets – Trajectories. Yeah. Yeah. Where the bullets landed, could it have happened as he said? And they concluded it could not have happened that way. Well, maybe he's a contortionist. Maybe. Yes. A 300-pound dude. Yes. Yep. (laughs) Another skill set. Yeah. Uh, Balasak was convicted of attempted murder and received 20 years in prison. The arson trial would also go forward at a later date in, it was later in 1992, although he was acquitted on those charges. Why? Because he didn't set the fire. Oh, so if you arrange for the fire to be set and you don't do it, you're clear? Well, and I don't know that there was solid evidence that he had actually arranged it but the but his charges were for arson so like they couldn't he was acquitted on that because he didn't he didn't say it balasak did pursue an appeal in the higher courts on this charge that's where i got a lot of the testimony from in 1993 the court of appeals overturned the attempted murder conviction saying quote the jury had essentially created new evidence by play acting Balasak's version of a struggle he said he had with the victim. So they were basically saying the jury acted improperly. Right. Wonder if a jury they just did that on their own, like when they yeah. were in the jury room. Yes. Yeah. Not okay. Yeah, it was like during deliberations. Okay. So they're saying the jury acted improperly. Um, They also said that due to the acquittal on the arson charge, the state no longer had a viable motive for the crime, which is interesting. Yes, that is. However. Like a reset button. Right. So they basically, they overturned the conviction and send it back down to the lower courts for a retrial. However, the state Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the jury had done nothing but critically examined the evidence and reinstated the conviction. Oh. So uh, Balasak had his conviction reinstated. Kindred, if you remember, Deborah Kindred, the oh, woman yes. he had married under yes. Weta's name, divorced Balasak in 1992 and changed her name from Weta back to her maiden name, Taylor. Okay. While in prison in Walla Walla, there were various lawsuits brought against prison staff by Balasak, some of which were argued by Balasak himself, and some of which actually set some legal precedents. It has to do with, um, he was a real, like, uh, inmate advocate and was working with a lot of inmates on some appeals stuff, but he actually argued a case before the Supreme Court um, that has to do with... The federal Supreme Court? Yeah. Just, okay. Yeah. That has to do with uh, an inmate's rights to bring a civil cause of action against uh, prison officials when it comes to violating civil rights. Okay. Something to do with that. I'm not going to go into that because it's right. like a whole other like section of the story. Right. So I'm not going to go into that. But it is really interesting if you ever yeah. if you ever want to look into it. Um, he sounds like actually he's. Probably an intelligent. I think guy. so. I think so. Yeah. Just got to use those powers for good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so Balasak was released in 2003 after serving 13 and a half years in prison, and in classic bad taste fashion, if you think the story ends here, you would be incredibly wrong. Again, I thought the story was ending here. This is not this is not the end. Um, so after leaving prison, Balasak had his name legally changed to Harrison Rains Hanover. Oh, interesting. And started working as a funds manager for J. Pierce Investments. I didn't see that coming. No. In 2009, he appeared to be implicated in the scheme to defraud a bank that had to do with Jay Pierce, but no formal charges were ever filed against him. He was just like a part of the thing. There were charges filed against other people, but um, there were a couple marriages like scattered in there as well. And those marriages came with orders of protection claiming that Balasak had been abusive. Okay. 
Um, now, this is again from Mental Floss, quote, in 2008, before they were divorced, the second of these women registered a nonprofit with the state of Washington called the First Hanoverian Church, listing herself as the director and Balasak slash Hanover as the chairman. Okay. So now he's the chairman of a church. <laughs> again, he seems to have a lot of skill set. But Balasak continued scamming and had to flee the country a year later after a plot to embezzle approximately $4.6 million was discovered. A plot from through the church. I believe so. I believe so. So Balasak flees the country, goes to Nicaragua, <laughs> where in October 2012... Uh, Balasak was arrested, charged, and convicted of multiple crimes related to the sexual exploitation of minors. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. He received 24 years in a Nicaraguan prison. Probably not a prison of choice. Along with his attorney, who received six years as an accomplice. Ooh. Right. Yeah. It's like what type of sketchy shit was going on there? Ugh. Anyway, uh, just months later, in April 2013, reports started coming out that Balasak had suffered a heart attack in prison and later died in the hospital. Uh, this was publicly attributed to the extreme heat in his cell, which led other inmates and families of inmates to call for an investigation into cell conditions and the health effects of extreme temperatures. Okay. Okay. Um, it is worth noting, I just want to put this out there, it's worth noting that as of 2016, there has been no death certificate made public and no information released as to his place of burial. burial. I was trying to find something more recent, but there is absolutely no evidence that this information has ever been produced. And it was from Nicaragua. From Nicaragua. Okay. That's the thing. It's like when the news of his heart attack started coming coming out, it was right. like being reported in Spanish language newspapers as, you know, and so you're in the, in the U S you're kind of getting bits and pieces and trying to get everything together, but they also don't necessarily have a duty to like produce the death right. certificate if they didn't want right. or tell I mean, people where he's buried. Yeah. Yeah. So there is part of me that's like, is, is he, he dead? <laughs> Because he, I feel like he, he may have just changed. His he's name. changed identities like three times. Yeah. So like, is he? But that is the story of Jerry Bib Balsack. I felt like we needed a map on the wall that we could put pins in, and you know, I know one of the articles I was reading had like a map that had arrows <laughs> and 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 pins, and it's hard to keep. Track. But it just is like so much different types of fraud. <laughs> Right. And murder. Attempted, and attempted. Attem well, attempted murder. And like this unintentional Jonestown connection. Because like he did not have anything to do with that. He right. he was not in contact with his mom. It was strictly his mom being like, that's my son. Right. So like. How tragic for her. I know. I know. It is really sad. But it is kind of, it's almost like lends itself to the scam because like. Right. He was trying to evade authorities anyway. And he was not in contact with his mom, so no. he didn't know that she no. and they did, had they, gone off on this. They did stake out her funeral, thinking that he might show up oh. to the funeral, and he did not. Right. He didn't so, know. Yeah. Wow, that's a crazy story that included a whole lot of different I tried crime. to hit everything you, you, in you one. Hit, <laughs> you hit a lot of crime in one story. Well, I am going to take this story a little bit out west. We are going to Montrose, Colorado. Okay. I mean, it's farther west than us. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's on the other side of the Mississippi and then on a little ways. And in Montrose, Colorado, we are going to meet a um, family. Um, the head of the family is Gerald Hollenbeck. Okay. He is an ex-Marine, is described as being a big character. 
He was also a big guy, and he went by the name of Cactus. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. But, you know, in Colorado. I know. And this, the town of Montrose at this time was described as around 16,000 people. Well, and which, I feel like when you're in the... That's a very, like, military nickname, too. You know what I mean? True. Like, but they said he kind of was like that. one of those big saguaro cactuses, kind of a big stocky. Yeah. And I love how they describe towns of 16,000 as small Small, towns. yeah. Our town has 700. <laughs> I don't even know if it has that much. Used and, to. It and, used to have something. And I people. grew up in a town of 250. So yeah, uh, to yeah. me, 16,000 is, is pretty pretty big. I love talking to my friends from the city because they're like, oh, yeah, we had like one of the smallest graduating classes, but it was like a thousand. So I'm like, there were 315 people in my graduating right. class. <laughs> I had a thousand in mine, but there were like... One larger city and like eight small towns yeah. that all fed into Yeah, it. that was a pretty big high school too. Yes. At that time. Probably still is. Back on track. Yeah. So um, Cactus's wife is Shirley. They sound like just a lovely couple. They had been married for quite a few years. Um, she had a daughter from a previous marriage the daughter's name is Diane McBride, and she has a sister, although, and let me back up a little bit and say, and say as a person of an age, I heard <laughs> this story. An age you will not disclose. It's of an age. I already, <laughs> I already said, your dad and I started dating 50 years ago, and oh, yeah. we've been married for Ever. over 40, so <laughs> I am of an age. And one of the things I do listen to to get some crime news is the AARP um, Perfect Scam podcast. Yeah. Well, and we've, I mean, we've done a story from AARP magazine. That and I enjoy them for a couple of reasons. They do it in a very kind of, I want to say entertaining way, because again, some of these stories are very sad. Yeah. But, you know, forewarned is forearmed. And if I listen to some of that stuff... I feel I'm kind of protecting myself. And yeah. I will say that's how I found this story. She, in, in the podcast, the, um, the daughter, Diana, mentions a sister, but I don't remember ever hearing a name. Okay. But she doesn't, isn't a real big part of this story. Okay. So they have this nice, very modest life in Montrose, Colorado, lived there for a year. As I said, Cactus was, he, also with the name of Cactus, it did mention that he was on the rodeo circuit for a while, and I just kind of picture this. Cactus in the rodeo? Yeah. <laughs> All I can think of now is just a cactus with a face on it, <laughs> of like running around. But it sounds like just a nice, normal family. Yeah. Um, and uh, Diana was quite young when mom remarried. So, you know, she very much had a good relationship with her stepfather. Well, time goes by. And as um, Shirley and Cactus are driving around Montrose, Colorado, they see billboards for a funeral home the Sunset Mesa Funeral Home, and they advertise cremation for $695. Oh, my God. And they're of modest means, as I said, and Cactus said, when I go, that's what I want you to do. I don't want you to waste a bunch of money. Yeah, and that this, is, I mean, that, that's a lot of money. But, the, I mean, that's the thing, is like the fun, the funerary industry I'm is thinking, an industry. And like, I'm thinking if you think that's a lot of money, you should see what caskets. I'm putting you in a cardboard box in the backyard. Yeah, and probably putting me in the river and send yeah, me down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wave, good, wave goodbye. Just toast, chuck me toast in a, a ditch. Drink and, you definitely said this. Just chuck <laughs> me in a ditch. It's fine. Okay. Nice to have that conversation with you. <laughs> so... Time goes on. In May 14th of 2017, Cactus passes away. He had, uh, I believe he was in his 80s. He suffered from some dementia, suffered from some Alzheimer. Um, they decided when they went together, they had a, a favorite dog that they had, had cremated, and they were all going to, you know, Aww. go together. Again, nice, just lovely yeah. family. So following his wishes... Shirley has him cremated. Um, she waited at this Sunset Mesa funeral home. 
Uh, she waits for his death benefit check to come, arranges to pick him up on a Thursday. Check comes, everything's fine. She goes to pick him up. And by the way, Diana, who I believe lived in California, said, Mom, I'll, I'm going to come out there. I'm going to come out there. She said, I can take care of it. Mom's pretty independent, pretty yeah. stubborn woman. Yeah. I'll take care of it. I'm fine. I can take care of it. She arrives, goes to the desk. I'm here to pay and get my husband's remains. There is a woman at the desk and goes back to get the remains, and she can't find them. Okay. Which is a little suspicious. So we now, the the owner of this funeral home in Colorado is Megan Hess. Megan is on vacation. This happened to be, I believe, Memorial Day weekend. Okay. She was in Hawaii. The woman at the desk calls her, says we can't find this man's remains, and she kind of huffs and puffs and tell her to come back on Tuesday, which she does. And in the meantime, Mom, of course, goes home. I don't know why she's huffing and puffing. Like... I know. That's <laughs> to me. I'm like, that's just fucking rude. Right. Like, this is somebody who you I'm can, on vacation. Yeah, I get it, but like, you can't find her husband. Like, <laughs> right. But there's really nothing rude. that the woman behind the desk. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Like, do. I don't understand why you're huffing and puffing about this. Right. So in the meantime, of course, mom goes home, calls Diana. This is the problem I'm having. Diana thinks this sounds really weird. I'm going to kind of look into the process of cremation. And she, of course, spends some time, goes on, figures out there are certain steps and procedures you need to be taking when it comes to cremation as far as making sure that um, the person being cremated, that they have the proper identification. So when somebody comes for the remains, everything is all tied up in a nice tidy bow and you can connect the dots and paperwork and all of these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So Monday or Tuesday arrives and the daughter decides to get in touch with Megan, the owner of this funeral home. And she said Megan was defensive right off the bat and started saying, this is a paperwork issue. Your mom showed up on the wrong day. She wasn't supposed to be here on Thursday. And the daughter, Diana, is thinking that my mom is a pretty organized woman. She would not make a mistake like that. This just sounds really yeah, suspicious. She wasn't like, like, you know, old. I mean, obviously, they're both older, older. but she hadn't like lost totally, her faculties totally or anything. Totally capable. Yeah. Totally capable. Okay. And Megan then said, don't worry about this. I will take care of it. I um, will deliver the remains out to your mom and take care of things. Okay. Um, Diana then questions Megan, can you explain the system you use that you have in place to ID the remains? What process do you use? Fair question. Because she's already thinking... And yeah. again, you know, it sounds like... Well, you said she had looked into... She had looked into it. And kind there are of... certain, like, standard procedures that seem to be, you know, applicable everywhere. Yeah. So, Diana calls mom. Make sure you check the paperwork. Make sure this is all good. Uh, Megan comes out, delivers the remains to uh, Shirley. Very polite, very kind brings them inside. Shirley says, I like them in this room. She puts them there. This is a box, like a box. I, I picture a box like you would get printer paper in, you know, with the two handles. Oh, that's a, that's a big box. A cardboard box, yes. Of his remains. Yes. That's ca- so, actually, okay, okay, hold on. That's actually kind of big for remains. I always picture these kind of small urns. Yeah, because so, like... I mean, there's a box downstairs, I'll just say. Really? <laughs> AJ's mom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's downstairs. But it, honestly, the box, granted, they split it between three people, but it's like a jewelry box almost. Right. Like, it's I, pretty, I, they're I pretty small. I kind of thought it seemed a bit large, but it is the outside of the box. We have to look what's inside. Yeah. So um, mom calls Diane. I have the remains. I'm sure it's cactus. The box is so heavy. Uh, Megan, the the uh, woman from the funeral home, says this is all my fault. I had put him in the safe while I was on vacation. And I first was thinking a small safe, but maybe they do have a larger walk-in type safe. I don't know how these I work. Okay, 
I have so many questions, but I'm going to let you keep going. Okay. <laughs> Maybe they'll be answered. <laughs> so um, Diana, again, knowing a little background, having researched, said, did she show you any paperwork, any kind of a paper trail? Is there any kind of a metal ID tag that should be attached with it? And mom looks and she said, no, it's just kind of a plastic bag inside with a twist tie. Okay. That's, I mean. Yeah. Okay. That just seems a bit random. I mean, I guess. I think they normally get sent in bags like that, though. But they do have the identification or right whatever. So there's just this nagging, yeah. especially in the daughter. She said, I'm the kind of person who just is like, okay, this is just not this sounding right. right. But in the meantime, she's not trying to upset her mom. Right. Her right. mom's going through a lot of stuff. Off I anyway. can't even imagine because that is like a very delicate situation. Right. Mm. Yeah, I can't even imagine. So now I'm going to talk about another individual. Okay. There is a reporter from Reuters, and you, Reuters is like one of the largest yeah. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in the world, and his name is Brian Grow. And at the beginning of the year, their bosses call them in and say, what stories would you like to think about doing this year? And they give them options. You know, here's here's a bunch of stories that I've thought about. And their bosses look at them and say, you know, one looks interesting. And on the bottom of the list, um, he had run across a story of a individual who was indicted in Detroit for taking human heads across state lines Mm -hmm. Um, And these heads happened to have, I think, HIV and hepatitis. So they were infected. I vaguely remember that. Okay. I vaguely remember that. And it had him, it got him saying, well, this sounds a little interesting and a little weird. And it tied into the body brokering business. Yeah. Now, I want to say at this point that there's a difference between organ donation and body donation and an organ donation is very regulated mm-hmm. um kind of okay it is it i mean the, kind of kind okay. of is the short answer i was we were talking earlier about this and john oliver who does last week tonight just did a great segment just a couple episodes ago about organ donation, I would actually recommend watching that because, yes, it's regulated, but like any government agency, it's like, you know, very kind of... I, I but get yes, that. Yeah. But when you're talking but about... But more regulated than some other... Body donation is barely regulated yeah. at all. Yeah. And it's wild. I will say it depends on states, mm-hmm. that there are some states that are a little more regulated than other states. But I was really surprised that I could go out tomorrow if I felt like it and probably start, you know, getting people to donate bodies to me so I could resell them. Yeah. Is, and they have like websites set up to, for just yes. like bones and various. Yes. That's totally legal, like not not illegal. This is one of the reasons why I'm not like – Super keen on donating my body to science because there is not, you would assume, a normal person would assume that you are going to, like, help with research, help Mm. medical students or something. And that is not always the case. And to be fair, I have a friend who is a doctor who said I would never donate my body to science because I have seen how medical students handle cadavers. Right. And it is not always appropriate. And I would not do that and i was like i have also had medical procedures done and appreciate the fact that the doctor probably had something to practice on before they start on a human being i agree i agree so it's kind of a two-edged yeah sword yeah but i do want to make the point that organ donation and body donation are two separate things yes um and some of the body donation sites are for profit. Mm-hmm. You know, they're there to make a profit. That's what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, so going back to Brian, the Reuters reporter. Okay. 
he, his boss says, well, that sounds kind of interesting. So he starts researching, and in his research, the Sunset Mesa funeral home keeps kind of popping up. So he wants to um, do a little more research yeah. on things. Yeah. So at some point in time, he gets the name of Shirley. Okay. He had gone to the funeral home, kind of looked around, kind of investigated. Of course, if you're Megan, you're not really talking a whole lot. He interviews some former employees okay. and said, did anything seem a little suspicious while you were working here? Yeah. Did you ever have a time when you were maybe concerned about how this was run and if you something you know if there was he he said he was very careful how he worded it one of the employees said well yeah i was working and a woman came in to pick up her spouse and i couldn't find him and the owner was on vacation so it basically matched up the story sure to and that's how he ran across shirley okay 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 so he calls Shirley. Shirley calls Diane, says, Who's this guy from this reporter from Reuters called me? And of course, then Diana calls back Brian. Hi, I'm Shirley's Her daughter, daughter. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And Diana hears a bit of his story and what he's researching. And she said, She's thinking, I'm kind of horrified, but yet this is kind of making things fall in place. So Diana goes to talk to Shirley very carefully mm -hmm. about this. And then Brian also goes and visits Shirley. He is, as I said, he interviewed some former employees who told him that they did have a freezer there that had some body parts in. And Okay. The, the, the owner also owned a flower shop next door, and a flower shop would also have refrigeration units. And occasionally there was overflow, so some of the body parts would end up in the flower shop. No. I honestly don't think that's legal, like, sanit because of sanitation. That's wild to me. That I don't want to go to a florist shop and be like, sure, let me get this bouquet. And they open. Open and move the foot over. Yeah, yeah. they have to move the foot, like well, slide the spleen. I had the, the impression it was probably in a back room someplace and not weird. there for people to see. Still weird. So as Brian says, would you mind if I have somebody run some tests on the remains that you have to see if we can sort through On the this. cremated on the, remains? On the cactuses. The cremains? Remains. Okay. Let's test them, see what we can find. So this Reuters has the remains that are tested by an anthropologist at Western Carolina University, is somebody who specializes in doing things like that. Yeah. From their test, they found out that the remains were most likely a female, about 5'7", about 120 pounds. Oh, and no. And cactus was... Quite a bit more than was that. Was none of that. <laughs> now, besides that, in the cremains, they also found some metal, like backing to a wristwatch. Okay. Some rivets, like you would have in a blue jeans. Okay. And parts of, like, a zipper. So I... Now, tell me if I am totally off base here. But I would assume that they would undress bodies before they are cremated. I would have thought so also. I mean, I, I, my, our family is not the no. cremation type family. No. You would think so. Remind me to ask AJ when this is all done. Okay. Now, <laughs> when Cactus went to the hospital, so at his end, he was wearing drawstring pants and a t-shirt. Okay. So. Oh, so even if they were left it, on him, if the clothes were left on him. He wasn't wearing jeans or had a wristwatch okay. or anything. Interesting. Okay. So, of course, this causes some 
shall we say, people to be called. And I found it kind of interesting that um, there's an agency in Colorado, it's called DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, and they're the ones that oversee um, funeral homes. Okay. But they receive complaints, but they don't seem to have a lot of teeth to be able to really mm -hmm. do much. Yeah. Um, they are more interested in issuing like your licenses yearly. Okay. But they had had quite a few um, complaints about this funeral home over the years. They they also would have some paperwork issues, like you have a certain amount of time once you have a death to turn in a death certificate. And yeah. to, so they basically know. just regulate yes. versus like discipline. But this Megan didn't really follow rules a lot. And they would call her and say, oh, we have this complaint against you. And she may call back. She may not. Oh, by the way, you haven't turned in this death notice yet. And you're, you know, a week past due. And that... um you know, she might answer or she might not. Huh. Okay. I just, I mean, that is the case with a lot of government agencies um, is they have limited power to have any sort of um, consequences for not following the regulatory authority. Like that is very, just with government agencies in general, like right. super, super common. It just didn't seem like much would be done. Yeah. And it's a little depressing to be like, well, we called her. Like if she calls us back, great. But if not, like, oh, well, you know, like that's not great. <laughs> right. So Shirley and Diana finally retain an attorney and they start uh, legal action against uh, the Sunset Funeral Home. Sunset Mesa. Um, they, as I said, they reported it to Dora. The attorneys uh, subpoenaed records from Dora and found hundreds of complaints. Um, oh my God. Months later, they finally, the state or Dora issued a cease and desist order okay. to the funeral home. Finally. Finally. Um, two weeks later, FBI raided the facility, and this was about the same time that the Reuters article came out. Okay. So, of course, in this, and, and by the way, they, um, I think it was the reporter said that when he was at the funeral home, there was like a bucket of random cremated remains sitting in the corner, like with some concrete mixer. And it looked like just shovelfuls of these things would go into bags. Oh, my God. That was his, his impression. So it's not even like they were, like, using the bodies for another purpose or whatever. They just didn't give a shit to give people the actual remains. They are just like, whatever we got. I think there's a little of everything. Okay. So this is big news because, again, at this time, there are 16,000 people. Okay, we'll call that a small town. Yeah, right. They um, started a Facebook page for victims of Sunset Manor. Okay. Hundreds of people joined this Facebook page. They, The reporter said at some point in time, they think maybe 3% of the population of this town oh my had God. been disposed of. Yo. Um, there were... The prosecutor discovers there's like 550 instances where there was no consent or forged consent. And this was also double dipping because you're charging people for your um, cremation and then you're turning around and, as they discovered, selling body parts oh. of these people online oh oh so they were selling parts they were selling body parts oh my god yes um so then they're they're making money on both ends of this deal Jeez. now there was some question about a charging for a crime because it's not illegal to sell body parts but then you have the issue of okay you have no consent from some people yeah. um, 
some forms didn't exist. Yeah. It's not legal to sell body parts, but it is Are also sure? not illegal. It is it's legal provided you follow the set of rules. In pursuing the story. Okay. Did you find something out that I don't know? <laughs> in pursuing the story, the um reporter, yeah, Brian purchased a vertebra a, a yeah, spine, uh-huh, and two heads. That's wild. And just went online and I think everything was about $300. Yeah. And had them shipped. Yeah. Purchasing them is legal. Selling them is like the regulated piece of it. It didn't sound to me like it was all that reg- regulated. Air quotes, all that yeah. Regulated. Yeah, yeah. But you know, heads were they say yeah. like three hundred bucks yeah. a piece. So you can just buy them online. It's like yes. the Amazon for body parts. Yes, and um, he put out about six inquiries. And a few didn't respond, and I'm saying to to places to that would purchase. Yeah, and some, I think, two responded and asked questions, mm-hmm. and I think kind of said, "No, you're not using them in the correct way." And then this one, um, Tennessee, I believe, just asked some basic questions, and yeah. he said. He used his real name. He used his Reuters email address. Yeah. And they had them shipped to a a specific location. And he was there when they arrived in a cardboard box, not marked body parts or anything. And um, then took them. They had a woman who specializes in anatomy at a university medical center, and they were taken directly to her. So yeah. they were then treated correctly, put in storage, and yeah, all of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just <clears throat> thought, really, you can do yeah. that. I was surprised. Yeah. So Megan kept pretty good records of what was sold, where it went. <laughs> But so they, I mean she can she can keep track of what she's selling but not like the cremains. We can see where her attention was. Yeah. So there were no records, they couldn't find records of Gerald. Oh man. Cactus. But later they found a handwritten ledger and lo and behold he had been sold in one piece to Saudi Arabia. Oh my gosh. So, wow. March 2020 um, they were charged six counts of mail fraud, two counts of transportation of hazardous material because some of these had infectious diseases. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a big issue. Right. So in July of 2022, oh, by the way, I did forget to mention Megan's mom. Her name is Shirley Coe. Okay. And she was a bit old. I'm thinking upper 60s or something. And lo and behold, she was the recovery person. So meaning she was the one who was, shall we say, disassembling. Oh, God. The yeah. deceased. Yeah. Um, she had no training. There were one buyer. And I will say, you know, this is one of those areas. I do see the legitimacy of people using these for research and medical training and whatnot. And yeah. someone had purchased some things from her, and they arrived um, totally improperly packaged with heads in bag with blood swirling around and the hair still attached, which was just, in their opinion, really questionable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is like totally. That's so gross. Yeah. It is very gross. So um, in July of 2022, both uh, the mother and daughter pled guilty to one count of mail fraud, aiding and abetting. And I'm not sure what abetting is. Aiding I've and heard abetting? it my entire life. Aiding, I understand that word. What's abetting? I think it's housing. Aiding no. and abetting. 
I think. Okay. I think. Okay. You can look that up. I'm going to yeah, keep going I'm gonna on. I'm going to look that up. So, the in January of 2023, so... Not that long ago, a federal judge sentenced Megan to 20 years in federal prison, which was five more years than was asked for by prosecutors. Wow. Because she showed no remorse. Yeah, it didn't She kept sound like saying, it. I'm doing this for the good of people. I'm doing this for the good of people. Whatever. Um, Do you want the answer to the abetting what question? What is abetting? So, aiding is providing support okay. or assistance. Abetting is encouraging or counseling someone to commit a crime. Does not necessarily mean that you help facilitate, but uh, just that you encourage it to happen. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. I'm thinking of many yeah. instances. Because you always hear aiding okay. and abetting in right. and one I, I meant to look chunk. that up and I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, Mom, Shirley, the the person who was... The disassembler. Disassembling in a very inappropriate manner, um, also received 15 years. Good. One count for mail fraud, one count for aiding and abetting. Let's see. March 6th of 2023, a federal judge ordered restitution for the 331 victims. Oh, my gosh. That they would get $1,300 apiece. The federal government seized two properties worth about $536,000, according to Zillow. Oh, my gosh. And a 2011 GMC Yukon. Um, there are $8.7 million in outstanding civil judgments. Yeah, that sounds that, about right. Right. So that's not going to cover everything. Yeah. In 2020... The Colorado legislator passed a bill signed by Governor Jared Paulus making it a class six felony to commit offenses against a deceased body. Yeah. But again, I'm thinking general terms, what does that include? How so I didn't look into all the details of Yeah, this is one of these things that's a little interesting because sim so on the last episode we talked about the new law in Illinois that deals with fertility scams. Right. Um or fertility fraud, right? Right. There along with that, like there in the last probably five years, there has sort of been this uptick in reports of funeral homes improperly storing storing improperly using bodies i mean it, it's it's just like this right there was one not long ago yeah and so i'm wondering if that's local big city news i wonder if that's like coming off the back of that to give people legal recourse for when this happened because all of a sudden it's just like happening a shit ton could be and in 2018, there was also a law passed that made it illegal for funeral homes and body brokers to operate under the same roof. Interesting. That's good. That is good. And that's, but that's in Colorado, you said. Right. And Interesting. all states are different. Yeah. Um, I do want to say in conjunction with this that they did, uh, the, I did hear some discussion with people uh, on talking about body donation and the suggestion was made to get in touch with your local university or medical school because mm -hmm. you can donate directly without having to go through like a broker, a, a broker, a body yeah. broker, yeah. and you have a little bit better idea of where someone is going and what they're going the the end intent. Yeah, and yeah. I thought, yeah, that's probably a good idea instead of waiting till the last minute and just answering an ad online. Yeah, I will also say if you are one of those people that are looking to donate your body um, as part of your end of life plan, mm -hmm. look into potentially donating your body to a body farm. Are you familiar with body farms? Oh, at all? definitely. Yeah. Patricia Cornwell has a book. Yeah. It was Patricia Cornwell called body farm. Yeah. So what that is, is uh, places where they will use bodies to research the way that it's they kind of forensic. Science. Yeah, it's for forensic science. So you kind of research the way they decompose or they interact with the environment or in various other mm -hmm. situations. Um, but those are like super great too because it is strictly forensic research. So like, right. I've considered that a little bit 
but like right that's another option and you again will know you don't have to go through a body broker you can deal directly with the body farm and not be on you'll be aware of like what is happening right to your body after right. you're gone so like but again this remember in the beginning when i said the billboards were up for the 695 dollars that is not expensive when you come to the end of a person's life and you need to, I mean, funerals are expensive. So again, you put up an in a, a sign for a lower price. Yeah. You're going to get people who do not have a lot of means possibly to do anything different. Yeah. And you draw them in. Well, you're going to be, well, at least these people were making money off the back end too. So it was kind of a right. bait and switch. But draws them in and a lot of times when i read about um because i did read some of the articles that were written by brian grow mm -hmm. and some of the there were some things i read about i couldn't believe actually happening but oftentimes there are people who if they have a family member who passes away do not have the means to do anything and that's right. why they are drawn to donating bodies to science so it it it's kind of yeah. um preying upon people who do not have the means to do other yeah. things yeah damn so that is my story of a scam. Well, depressing. I know. Way to end it on a low note. Classic yeah. Janelle move. <laughs> you know, this is two episodes I and know. I was so excited to explore some, you know, murder or something and I still have yet to do one. I know. Well, I tried to find one with murder in mine on purpose. <laughs> you know, when you were talking scams, I was looking up murders connected yeah. to scams, and it was mainly people who were victims of scams who had lost everything, who had killed themselves and their families. Oh, that's Other extra depressing. depressing. Yeah. yeah. Well, before um, you decide what to do with your body after you die, why don't you check out this podcast? Need an escape? Vanish into the depths of a magic forest. Head out on an interstellar repair mission. Travel back in time to change the future. Explore inside someone or something else. Meet dragons, werewolves, birds, bears, aliens, mermen, and a man with a fishbowl for a head. All in ten minutes or less every week. Tune in to 600 Second Saga for your weekly science fiction and fantasy escape. All right, ladies and gents and friends of the non-binary, that has been our show and the end of your run <laughs> on our on our lovely show, Mom. And I didn't get to tell any embarrassing stories about you. I forgot to. No, but I would make sure Tiff edited those out. <laughs> I would give Tiff 20 bucks. Oh, my God. Make her keep that no, in. It has been lovely having you on. I have very much enjoyed it. And this is the first time, actually, I've gotten to see your process of recording. It was very interesting. Yeah. But I know we miss Janelle. Yes, And look forward to her returning. Yes. But, man, yeah. I appreciate all the work you have put into this for the last, I believe you're at six yeah, years or so. Six or seven, somewhere in there. I realize oh, no, Janelle's is, the one that keeps track of that. I know. I, was thinking, <laughs> I think there's one around yeah, this time. No, but yeah. this is truly a a uh, endeavor of passion for you. Absolutely. Yeah, so we uh, will have another guest host next month. It'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise. Uh, but... That is it for our show. Our sound and editing is by Tiff Fullman. Our music is by Jason Zashevsky, the Enigma. This has been the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. We will see you in two weeks. Goodbye. So long. It was as if a wave of evil washed over this town. Are all people wearing some form or